Hi, I'm Doug. I'm here with Dr. Benjamin Noonan, and we want to encourage you in studying the biblical languages. Dr. Benjamin Noonan, Associate Professor of Old Testament and Hebrew at Columbia International University. It's great to have you on the program today. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to record on site in uh -huh. your office here uh -huh. at uh, CIU in Columbia as well. Yeah, it's been good to have you on campus. Yeah, excellent. We got to uh, to enjoy Passover Seder mm -hmm. this week. So, mm -hmm. so that was yeah. a lot of fun. Yes, it's been a great opportunity to, to come visit. Well, we're uh, talking here, of course, about the biblical languages on this program. So why don't we start with um, you telling us a bit about your background and then what, what motivated you? What kind of opportunities did you have to, to get going and studying the biblical languages and especially Hebrew? Yeah. So I've always had an interest in the Bible. And uh, so when I went away to college, I wanted to be able to learn the biblical languages uh, so that I could understand the Bible the best that I could. And so I took both Greek and Hebrew and I absolutely loved it. It just unlocked a completely new world for me, and uh, so much so that I stayed around at Wheaton College, which is uh, where I went to college. I stayed around an extra year afterwards, and I did their biblical exegesis program, which really gave me a chance to focus on the biblical languages, and uh, that just confirmed for me that that was the path that God had me on, and God led me from there to Hebrew Union College, and one of the reasons I picked that school is because I wanted a place where I could really focus on the languages, uh, and I really had that opportunity there. Excellent. And so you went to Hebrew Union, did, mm -hmm. uh, did your Ph.D. work mm -hmm. there, and uh, you, by the way, you are my doctor father. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so Dr. Benjamin Noonan supervised me and just uh, completed here a few months back, so... Does that mean, can I call you uh, Ben now? Yeah, that's, that's completely <laughs> okay. fine. You are Dr. Smith yourself after all. Okay. So yeah. uh -huh. but, uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. Yeah, so it was a pleasure to work with you, and uh, you, know, you, you deserve uh, much honor and thanks for that. Yeah, thank and you. Uh, I really appreciate the, the guidance you gave me along the way. And uh, certainly the, the love that uh, you got for the languages uh, just, just came right through and was, uh, was such a help and blessing. But you, uh, you did your dissertation on non-Semitic loanwords in the Hebrew Bible, a uh -huh. Hebrew Union, right? Now, what got you interested in that specific topic? Uh -huh. Yeah, so it was, it was a really fascinating topic for me, and I do have uh, a copy here. of uh, It's since been published, and in terms of my actual dissertation, it was slightly different. I didn't just focus on uh, the Hebrew Bible. I also looked at Northwest Semitic, so Ugaritic and Phoenician and whatnot, and I looked at loan words and, you know, some of your viewers may be like, well, what in the world is a loan word? Yes. <laughs> um, so a loan word is basically a word that a, uh, one language has adopted from another language, typically because they don't have a word for that thing. And uh, For example, English has a lot of loan words. Uh, two good ones, uh, both words for food, salsa and sushi. Not native English words right. come from Spanish and Japanese, but we adopted those from those languages because we didn't, have any way to refer to them, and we wanted to make sure that we could. Right. Why invent a new word when somebody already has one we can take? Right, right, exactly. Uh, so that's what loan words are. And I think as I was doing my, um, especially my coursework at HUC, I was really fascinated by just all the, the interconnections uh, between different cultures, especially during the late Bronze Age, uh, when I was studying, say, Ugaritic and Amarna Akkadian. And then also in some of my history and archaeology classes, just thinking about the international trade. And it's like, this is a really fascinating topic because we see how people are interacting. And as they're interacting, they're borrowing these, these words. Uh, so I was thinking I wanted to do something along those lines. And then I was, I was reading uh, an article by one of my professors at HUC, uh, Dr. Stephen Kaufman, where he, he called for this study of late Bronze Age terminology and how it uh, reflected this linguistic and also cultural contact. It's like, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity I had. He, uh, he ended up being one of my readers, and then Neely Fox was, uh, was the, the other reader. And I'm just really thankful because it was a really fascinating study. Right. I noticed the subtitle of your published dissertation is a lexicon of, of language content. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a reference work of all these non-Semitic loanwords that somebody can go to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 that's excellent. Do you have any favorite loanwords um, that uh, stood out? 
Favorite loan words? I don't know. I mean, there's kind of some of the standard ones that people are probably familiar with, uh, words like pharaoh and that kind of thing. I really like a lot of the Egyptian loan words that we find, um, partially because I'm interested in where they show up. There's a lot in the Pentateuch. Well, I did the flood account, and we've got uh, Teva. Yeah, 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 Teva, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. The, the word for ark, some kind of box or chest, which shows up there in the flood account, and also in Exodus 2, where right. Moses is placed in that. So, yeah, it's a great, a great word there. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I know you've got a lot of material in Daniel and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Esther as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, yeah, some of the Greek yeah. loan words or Persian loan words there. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, it's amazing from Egypt to Greece to Persia to, that's <laughs> to right. beyond, yeah. That's right. Well, that's a great resource, and it uh, sounds like you had Thank a great you. experience studying I did, that. yeah. Uh -huh. And that led to further um, research and writing and uh, teaching. You're, you're teaching here at, at CIU, teach Old Testament, uh, Hebrew. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep, yeah, I've been here for about 10 years now and just love it. It's been a great place to be. Right. And uh, you've been involved with uh, publishing, with got to do a festschrift for your mm -hmm. uh, for your Dr. Fodder, right? For right, Dr. yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. something that uh, my wife, uh, Jennifer Noonan, uh, and I, as well as uh, Aileen Dallaire, she's another uh, Hebrew Union College graduate, we really wanted to honor Dr. Kaufman because he taught us so much and one of the ways that we wanted to do that was to produce something that wasn't just like studies that we did, but something that really was in his his spirit and his uh, the, the tradition of grammar that he taught us. And so we've attempt we've attempted and hopefully been successful in putting together a Kaufman grammar that yes. kind of enshrines the the many things that he taught us. Yes. So this is not not merely a, a festschrift, not just some sort of collection of. As as good as those things are, uh -huh. of, oh, yeah. of random type essays of different interests, but an integrated. I mean, this is a reference grammar. Yeah, of its own, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So you've got chapters here on nouns, adjectives, adverbs, uh -huh. definiteness, the definite article, prepositions, tense, aspect, and mood, the verbal stems, the different conjugations. Uh, poetry, uh -huh. teaching uh -huh. methods. Uh -huh. uh, this is an excellent resource, and if you're going to study Hebrew, it belongs in your library. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And your hands frequently. <laughs> that's right. Refer to it often. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And I came across your writing for the first time with this book, um, uh -huh. as, as far as uh, a full work by you. I'd seen the, the Festschrift before, mm -hmm. but 2020, I remember pre-ordering from um, one of the outlets through Zondervan, this book, and receiving it, I believe, I think I got it in April of okay. that year, and okay. we're in COVID, and there's lockdowns, and needing to get out of the house for some fresh air, so I took this thing on walks and just marked it up uh, like crazy. And, yeah, I see uh, all the markups there. Yeah, then had the opportunity to study with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this book and, and how it came to be? I mean, this is this is a densely packed but also readable introduction to these uh, advances in the study of Biblical Hebrew and Biblical Aramaic. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I approached Zondervan and asked them if I could do this project. I had a, a few things going on in the back of my mind. One was just the fact that nobody had done it yet. We had uh, Constantine Campbell's Advances in the Study of Greek, which I had found helpful for myself just in terms of thinking about Greek. It's like, okay, but nobody has actually done a Hebrew version yet. And I had, I had background in a number of the topics, uh, but didn't know everything about each of those topics. And it's like, this would be a really fun book to research and to write and to put together and hopefully something that'll be helpful for, uh, for students and um, just people of all, all different levels, uh, something that my students would benefit from. So I approached them and uh, they you know, took me on for that project. And I'm really thankful because it really was a fun project. I learned a lot and it's just, uh, it's, it's been a great, a great resource for a number of people. I've had a lot of uh, people tell me, thank you. And I know it's been helpful to them and that's exactly what I've wanted it to be. What would you say your target audience is for this as far as a minimum of where you're pitching this and, and upward? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, it's not so good for first years in terms of what they're going to be able to catch because they're still trying to learn the basic grammar and whatnot. Right. Second years will be able to get into some of the stuff that's in there. Uh, second year and beyond, uh, if you've got like an advanced Hebrew course, you know, maybe Hebrew 4, Hebrew 5, something like that. Right. 
uh, PhD studies. We yes. use it here at CIU for PhD studies along with uh, Con Campbell's book for, for Greek. Um, so that kind of level. Uh, pastors who are you know, proficient, who feel like they've got a good background in the biblical languages, obviously professors. So those are the kinds of people that it's targeted towards. Right. And you've got uh, a survey, sort of a literature review in the mm -hmm. different subfields that you cover mm -hmm. and um, so, some analysis, evaluation, but also uh, I love the way the ways forward uh, uh -huh. that you have in the various chapters. So, uh -huh. so this is a, a veritable seed plot of research ideas. Uh -huh. Which is actually partially how you got your dissertation idea, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, the, the chapter on uh, discourse analysis. I've been interested in discourse analysis for, for many years. I've performed it in English with some, some other uh -huh. resources, and then once I got into the languages, I really wanted to explore. I knew I wanted to do some kind of dissertation involving discourse analysis. And then when I read your chapter, learn more about the various schools of thought, which is so valuable because uh -huh. uh, many discourse analysis resources only present one particular way of thinking about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you suggested an integration of methods and a uh, blend. And uh, yeah, it just opened up so many yeah. fruitful uh, doors of investigation. Mm -hmm. And you continue to have an interest, I'm sure, in all of these topics, but discourse mm -hmm. analysis is an ongoing interest of yours as well, you know, mm -hmm. research interest, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, ongoing research interest, um, you know, and supervising a few more uh, PhD students who are going to be doing topics along that line. Uh, I had the, the opportunity, the honor, the pleasure of being at, uh, which you were, you presented for this as well, but the uh, Hebrew Discourse Conference at Dallas International University. Yes on uh, Dallas, Texas last October, and that was just fabulous. I gave the the plenary session. They asked me to do a, a survey of sorts of uh, just the history of Hebrew discourse studies, where we've been, where we're going, and uh, what kinds of things can we do to uh, continue to improve and to build on the strengths that we have. And that was just a lot of fun. So many good presenters there, including your own session. And Thank just, you. yeah, I had a great time there. Yeah, that was a, a very valuable uh, experience there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you're uh, encouraged, I guess, about what you're seeing with the, mm -hmm. the interest in that uh, that field. Oh, definitely. I mean, even the fact that they can have that kind of a conference, which they used to have something like that um, a number of decades ago, but it had it had stopped. But there's enough interest in in discourse analysis these days that they can put together a conference and have. I mean, we had more than a hundred people. Right. I think that uh, that signed up and and participated in some way, and so it's just it's fabulous to see that kind of interest and to see people again moving the field forward. Right, people like yourself, like the other presenters, who are uh, advancing our knowledge of discourse analysis and our application of discourse analysis when it comes to Hebrew. I should I should back up and mention if you're not familiar with discourse analysis, we're talking about analyzing a text beyond the level of the sentence is how it's traditionally characterized, or we could say beyond the level of a clause. In other words, we're looking at uh, the bigger context and trying to assess the part, uh, the parts in light of the whole and seeing how everything fits together and how the information flows and so forth. So uh, it's just a, a very valuable exercise. I have encountered at times, though, uh, and you may have as well, some resistance to the integration of discourse analysis and bringing in insights mm -hmm. from general linguistics, just the study of, of how languages work generally mm -hmm. into studying the Old Testament and studying the New Testament. Have you experienced some of that as well? And what, what would you say to folks that are a little suspicious, maybe think it's sort of a fad? Mm. Well, that's a good question. And there's some truth to it, because even when we look at the field of linguistics, we can see how the way we think about linguistics is very different now than it was 100 years ago. There's also a lot of continuity there. But there's some significant differences in terms of the school of thought. So some people may say, like you said, well, it's only, it's only a fad. Uh, this is going to change. Well, yes, there can certainly be changes, but there's also a lot of important insights that we get. And uh, part of this is because in the field of linguistics, we try to look at languages across the world and notice patterns and notice trends and those kinds of things can be really helpful yes i mean if we suggest something like we say well in hebrew the verb works this way but verbs don't work that way in really any other language of the world then that's that's probably a problem <laughs> yes so the insights we get from linguistics can help us to to check some of those ideas and to say, okay, maybe that's not it. Here's probably how we want to understand it instead. 
And the payoff that we've had, uh, that we've seen, I mean, for the, the verbal system, for example, there's still a lot of things we need to unpack and to refine our understanding for, I think, but, but for the most part, we've learned a lot. And so people may be hesitant about applying linguistics, but there's, there's a lot of good stuff that we can learn, and the, the fruit, the payoff, really shows just how important it is to do that. Sure. Do you think it'd also be fair to say that those that would push back and argue that it's something of a fad are also relying on linguistic understandings that, that they're not even aware of? Oh, I mean, oh yeah. Labeled that way, mm -hmm. you know, when some of their uh, resources maybe were written 100 years ago, but yep. they still have those those sort of ideas that have now been shown to to be suspicious. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's like almost anything in life, right, yes. where we always have a way of thinking about it, whether we realize it or not. And yeah, even the people who say, we don't need linguistics, they've got a linguistic system in their mind, even if they don't know what to call it or they're not thinking about it in that way. Right. And the best type of research that's being done in this vein, even though it's a newer discipline per se, it's still seeking to recover what the way of thinking was in these mm -hmm. ancient texts, not trying to invent or impose something on right. it, but trying to just look at it afresh and say, what's really going on here? Right. Exactly. And, and I think at least for myself, that's one of the reasons why I'm not just interested in, you know, what are the developments we have in modern linguistics, but let's also try to think about Hebrew, for example, as a Semitic language. Yes. And so trying to compare it and be aware of other languages like Akkadian and Ugaritic, how do the Semitic languages work too? That's an important thing that we don't always, we don't always do. Sometimes we just try, uh, we just study Hebrew by itself. And we've got a very limited picture if we're not thinking about it in terms of the way the Semitic languages work. Right. So you get some extra insights when you go to those languages. I guess when we think about a, a work of literature, I mean, uh, on this podcast, I've mentioned that I, I'm a confessional scholar. I do believe mm -hmm. the Bible is the word of God, but it is also given to us in human language. Yes. And biblical Hebrew in the Bible is just a snapshot of those eras, it's not the entire language system right. that people were using at right. that time. So is it fair to say that when we look at some of those cognate languages, we start to get some uh, pictures, some glimpses through the windows, as it were, mm -hmm. into the bigger language picture? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that um, you mentioned uh, Stephen Kaufman earlier, yes. one of my professors at HUC. That's one of the things that he really helped us to see because he was... He was amazing when it came to his knowledge of the Semitic languages, and that just gave him this, this great picture within which he was able to read Hebrew, and he passed that on to us. He taught us to approach texts that way. Uh, you know, it, what we find in the Bible, it, it, it has to make sense, right? We're, we're reading representatives of real language from yes. certain periods and yes. from certain dialects and, and whatnot for sure. Um, but we have to think about him again as a Semitic language. Yes. Wow, we've been able to cover a lot of ground today, but I think we're going to have to do one more episode. Okay. So thanks again for being on today, and uh, we'll look forward to another episode with Dr. Benjamin Noonan very soon. Yeah, thank you, Doug. It's been good to be here.